Okay. All right. Well, let me start for a second and talk a little bit about, about myself. Um, in 1993, I went to work for New York Life Insurance Company as an agent. Uh, I was, when I was pretty young, I lost my parents tragically the same day, mother and father at the same time. So I didn't have the luxury of going to college or going, getting an education, so I, was, I had to hit the ground running and start taking care of myself. So I worked for New York Life from 2000 and, pardon me, 1993 through 2003. In 2001, I discovered just by accident that New York Life had been concealing death benefits from widows and orphans on life insurance policies by omitting the existence of certain benefits from their claim forms. So I brought a class action lawsuit against the company in 01. It was settled in 2003. Uh, 4,198 policyholder families received benefits because of me, and that's where I got the idea that the company that I was representing really wasn't all that it was cracked out to be. And it made me begin to question everything that I saw with a number of insurance companies and a number of strategies I've been, I've been seen saw being sold or promoted in different avenues. Uh, the same year in 2003, I discovered that my largest holding, it was an offshore currency trading fund called Tradex, was a Ponzi scheme. And I had a million six in the fund when it went up. And I had to get back to work. So in 2004, January, I started my current company, Wealth Management International. And 95% of our practice has been the uncovering research due diligence and the assistance in prosecution of frauds and misrepresentations on the, on the senior or the, or the investor client. So I come from a different perspective. I'm essentially a turncoat, someone who used to be an insurance agent selling this stuff. Although I never sold a life settlement or a radical or an offshore life insurance policy. But I recognized when I started my company in 04 that I really had to have very broad and also deep knowledge of these various financial instruments that affected financial planning, estate planning, asset protection, if I was going to be any good at what I was doing. So what I'll be talking about today is some of the economic and non-economic benefits of domestic and foreign life insurance policies, how they contrast, um, some of the benefits of offshore products, um, and there are a number that are legitimate. Although I'll also be covering some of the cons or the perils of these transactions where there's a number of problems with these things that's often either not explained or played down by the, uh, the professional advisor to cause the investor to enter into the transaction so they can make the commission, they can make the deal, get management fees. And as you are probably aware, life insurance and annuities pay among the highest commissions of any financial product you could buy in the industry. All right, so first of all, let's talk about some of the good things. So benefits of offshore life insurance, it's also known as private placement life insurance, is that the policy cost may be lower than domestic retail policies. So when you go to you know, a New York life or a Met life or a Prudential and you buy a policy, we're paying retail. Uh, the commissions on those policies to the agents generally are between 75 and 150 percent of the first year premium that are paid for those policies. So it explains to you just how heavily front loaded they are. So that has to be made up by higher insurance charges and other uh, policy costs to recover that for the insurance company, which can take sometimes several years. With offshore policies, they're structured more like um, boutique investment products, creating your own policy. Uh, typically, premiums have to be at least a half million dollars. Uh, per year for at least a few years, so typically you have to have a couple million dollars or more in premiums paid into the policies to make them attractive for the offshore insurer to issue the contract and go into business with you. But once you're in, the expenses can be far less than what you'd have for the cost of insurance and other, other issues. However, these policies are often designed as high cash value and very low death benefit policies to minimize the insurance charges. So they're used more like investment products than they are used as insurance, where you're risk shifting or if someone dies, there's a tremendous increase over what was paid in premiums paid to the beneficiaries. All right, so um, also another benefit of offshore policies that you cannot do to, um, with domestic insurers is you can pay your premiums other than in cash. In other words, if you've got appreciated real estate or portfolios that can be either collaterally signed or pledged um, the ins offshore insurer will often accept that as premium payment, so no actual cash has to trade hands. But keep in mind that if that occurs, and that asset which is being used to pay the premiums for the foreign policy contains a, a, a built-in gain, or a capital gain, the capital gains tax is recognized that moment that the premium is paid or that it's, it's collaterally assigned, because it's essentially constructive receipt by the offshore insurer. Um, also, you're able to invest in asset classes that are prohibited by U.S. insurers. So typically, U.S. insurers only allow you to invest in mutual funds, stocks and bonds that are inside those funds. They don't typically allow hedge funds or exotic investments that you may want to take advantage of or in certain currency funds, arbitrage funds. 
offshore insurers will typically work with you and design a portfolio that has those asset classes in it. So that's another attractive feature where you have broader and 